My name is Kai Robertson, and thank you for joining our session on Waste Not Whatnot. Um, we have a wonderful panel here of um, three speakers, and um, I will start out by giving a bit of context about this issue of waste of food, and then we get to hear from uh, Wen Lee from AFAC, and Lynette Johnson from St. Andrews Society, and uh, Amy Bachman from DC Central Kitchen. And so we'll each take about 10 minutes to talk. We'll have, pause for one question between each of us. And then um, ho probably, hopefully, I still have time left at the end for, for a more robust discussion. So without further ado, um, I, again, my name is Kai Robertson, and I work on a lot of food loss and waste issues. And I'm going to take a bit of a, a global perspective just to put into context um, a, a lot of what the other folks will talk about in terms of food rescue, but I'm going to talk about food loss and waste and you know, why it happens and how it happens globally. Um, because I think it's, it's really helpful to see how the pieces of what you're all working on and, and the, the panel here is working on fit into the, the big picture. So, um, okay, are these statistics familiar to any of you that we lose about a third of all the food that's grown? Okay, so for, you're all fairly informed crowd. Um, what, this is a global statistic. Uh, it's plus or minus 10 or 15 percent, uh, but roughly one in three uh, calories. Well, yeah, uh, one in three pounds of what is grown is is not eaten, and we convert that to calories. It's one in four calories. Uh, the statistics themselves don't matter so much, except for the fact that it's really a huge amount of food that is grown, produced, and never eaten by people. So uh, that there's a lot of uh, issues related to that. This is you know, one aspect of it, which again, when we're talking about food rescue, about a billion people around the world, so that's three times the size of the United States, are food insecure. They don't, um, they need supplemental food from somewhere, and yet, in a world of so many hungry people, we don't use a third of the food that's produced. So obviously, you can't just take all the food that's not produced and feed it to hungry people, but there's definitely a huge opportunity to rescue food and get it to people in need. Uh, I'm going to use this framework for um, my 10 minutes, and that is to talk a bit about, again, what is food loss and waste, because it's really not as simple as it sounds. Why does it matter beyond the food security issues? What can we do about it, and uh, how much is there? Um, not necessarily in that order. But the uh, logo you see on the top left hand side there, Further With Food, that is a website that's been created as a cent virtual center for food loss and waste solutions. So if you're, if you're involved in this topic, if you're looking for solutions, who's doing what, uh, that is intended to be a one-stop source to go for information related to the food loss and waste. So I encourage you to go visit further with food. Uh, that's also where you can find the, the deeper dive on all of these four topics as well. And I'm going to just skim over them today. <coughs> so uh, what is food loss and waste? Generally, uh, if you think about it in very simplistic terms, it's that which is food not eaten by people for whatever reason. And you'd think that would be a simple uh, definition, but it gets a bit tricky because um, when you start looking at the numbers and talking about food loss and waste, for some people that also includes things like inedible parts, which are the bones, rinds, and pits. So let me show you with these pictures what I mean by this, uh, the, the challenge in, de in defining food loss and waste. And it's important to just, when you when you hear people talking about amounts of food loss and waste, to keep in mind you know, that, that you want to be clear about what they're actually referring to. So the, the obvious food not eaten example is this orange that's moldy. We would typically not eat that, and that gets composted and thrown away. So that's a, a, a was a food, no longer something that's really edible. The middle picture there is um, a head of cauliflower, and that is the stalk and the leaves, which some people would say, well, that's not food, that's an inedible part, I'm going to toss it. But in fact, actually, you can chop that up, put it, saute it, put it in a soup, and, and eat what we, some of us would call the inedible parts. Um, we've got leftover food that's tossed um, sometimes. This is an example of my, you know, my own house. All these pictures are from my own house. Um, my you know, daughter couldn't finish her bagel, so she put it in the fridge. None of us could eat it because she was sick that day, so she ate, but she did eat it the next day. So that was, you know, avoided food loss. The hot dogs, uh, anybody of you have teenagers in your family? Okay, so after, literally two seconds, or uh, 30 seconds after I took this picture, my son ate all the hot dogs. So that was, <laughs> you know, teenagers are great source of um, <laughs> reducing food loss in your house. <laughs> and he's off to college now, so we're having a lot more food loss and waste in our house. <laughs> in any case, um, but 
loss and waste doesn't just apply to what happens in our households. Um, it's also really there's food loss uh, and waste of the long entire value chain. So when we talk about what you know that one third of all food produced never grown, it happens up and down from the beginning to the end of the value chain, and it starts uh, on farm where the food is not harvested for whatever reason. Um, thankfully, there are gleaners, and others will you'll hear about that, that rescue that food. Uh, it happens during handling and storage when food might be spilled, those gets moldy, pests infestations. During processing and packaging, even in the, in the most advanced manufacturing uh, facilities, there's spills, there's, there, there's mislabeled product, there's a lot of food that ends up not being sold to people for whatever reason. And then again, during distribution and market in the grocery store, as well as when we all people eat uh, in restaurants or at home. And this, um, this all adds up. And the reason it matters is, as, as I mentioned, the, the food security aspect is critical. Um, there are social, economic, and environmental benefits, though, from reducing food loss and waste. And so on the social side, we can rescue more food and improve food security, which is great. We feed hungry people now and also feed the growing population in the future, because those of you who kind of look at, work, look at maybe global issues, um, there is the statistic that we have you know, 9 to 10 billion people that will be in this, on the planet in a few decades, and that we need to double food production. But if we say we need to double food production and we're already losing a third of what is produced, that just doesn't make sense. So we need to also be looking at better capturing the food that is grown to, in, today, so that we, because we, we, we can't just double production. That's not feasible on the one finite planet we have with the existing state of, of resources. From an from a economic perspective, so this is a real business issue for companies and, and cities as well. Uh, it costs to take food away and, and cart it off to the landfill or cart it off even off to composting. So the, the, um, there's a real economic case, financial case to be made for increasing efficiency and avoiding <coughs> unnecessary costs. And no company buys food in order to throw it away. They usually buy it, convert it to something and sell it and make money on it. So um, there's a lot, for those of, you, those of you who may work with businesses, there's a huge financial case to be had to um, address food loss and waste. And it saves consumers money. You know, if we're, buying food that we're not using, while it might appear as a sunk cost in our heads, you're still throwing away something that you purchased, and that doesn't really make financial sense. And then from an environmental perspective, there's a lot of embedded resources, so all the food that's grown has water embedded in it, and the inputs that were used, and, and, and labor, and, and the land, land, and so that those embedded inputs are, are, are you know, in essence, wasted. And it adds to climate change when food decomposes in a landfill. So if you think about food loss and waste and look at the global figure, Globally speaking, if food loss and waste were a country, you'd be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases. And that's huge, uh, especially you know, just behind China and the US, and we, we know the impact of climate change. Um, so there are a lot of cities and others around the world who are actually focused on reducing food, amount, food in their landfill and in their municipal waste stream in order to meet their climate change and greenhouse gas reduction goals. So again, just tapping on the different elements of how food loss and waste actually has a lot of impacts that we don't always necessarily think about right away. Um, and the impacts vary by food. This is an interesting statistic that um, uh, one from the National Resources Defense Council put, pulled together. If you throw out a hamburger with all its embedded impacts, <coughs> that's the equivalent, from a water perspective, of a 90-minute shower. If you throw out an apple, that's the equivalent of a seven-minute shower. Either way, that's a huge waste of, use of, of misuse of water. Um, so just, again, thinking about these impacts of food when it's not eaten, um, and let diving beneath the kind of obvious is comes up, you know, as you come up with some really interesting um, aha moments of how and why wasting food and, and not using food to, to intended purpose of, of consumption um, has impacts beyond what we normally think of. So how much there is there? Um, the, just the estimates vary. There are, there are about four estimates in the US. These are all also on the Further With Food website if anybody's a data geek and wants to dive into the numbers. Um, the USDA estimates that it's 66.5 million tons. The EPA says it's 36 million tons disposed. That's because USDA looks at a different um, scope. They, they actually look at any food that would have been available, could have been eaten, and wasn't. And EPA is only really looking at that which goes to landfill. So um, the USDA includes that which might go to animal feed or to compost or to anaerobic digestion. The EPA is only looking at the landfill piece. Suffice it to say, there's a lot. and. Um, there is a lot of activity being taken to cut it, um, cut it around the world. And around the world, where the food loss and waste happens does vary. So again, it, useful to think about. In the US, uh, we're you know, falling the North American side, the left side here. Consumption, we the people are a big part of the problem, about you know, half of all the waste. Again, according to the estimates from the FAO, 
um, happen at the consumption end, that's the green bar. And as you go to the lesser, de less developed, less wealthy economies on the far right, you'll see that this, the problem is much more at the farm level. And it's not to say that farm level losses don't happen in the, in the, in the Western North American you know, your developed world context. They certainly do. And the data is actually not very, um, it's very quite sparse. So these, these, are, these again are estimates. But just to give you a sense that in the wealthy nations, we the people are a big part of the problem. Um, what can we do about it? This is uh, a food recovery hierarchy that's really useful to, to be thinking about as, um, as you think about this topic because um, there are better uses of food. The best use is to not create surplus food in the first place and to um, utilize that which is grown to feed people. If um, that can't be done, of course, the obvious next best option is to feed hungry people. Um, as the group here will, will attest to, that's really critical to feed hungry people. Um, but you know, food is never typically, like, at least in the, in the business context, a, a food manufacturer, a food retailer is not in the business of producing food in order to feed hungry people. It's, it's, it, they, will, they should be focusing on taking that surplus and, uh, and sending it to donation if, if need be. But it's an interesting perspective to be thinking about that you, know, you really want the source reduction to happen first. So avoid, if you're in the restaurant business or in any, any other kind of uh, business that generates food waste, source reduction first, feeding hungry people second is donations. After that come better uses, feeding animals or industrial uses. Landfill is then at the bottom. So that's the least preferred option for food. Any, everybody, anybody, anybody disagree with that? <laughs> Great. Um, and so just a couple of things that people are, uh, are doing to try to Raise awareness on, on food waste. This is from actually Giant Foods, right in the in the area. I saw this um, in their magazine in April. Great message to there's no need to toss out the leafy green tops. Letting people know you can eat the greens and there's a variety of variety of ways to um, use them. The, in this exact same newsletter, they had a <laughs> recipe in which they also said, you know, use the Swiss chard and discard the stems. So I'm like, no, don't, <laughs> you know. And so anybody who's in the, in the recipe or cookbook business, please <laughs> scratch that from the, from the recipe because um, all parts of the food really are, are edible. It just takes a little bit of creativity. And speaking of creativity, um, there's a campaign that's now going on elsewhere in the U.S. Um, this started out in, in, in France. And, uh, it, this is, well, this didn't start out there, but they, the, the Europeans often are kind of leading into these issues. 2014, so three years ago, they already ran a campaign on imperfect produce. So, um, there's a lot of opportunity to think about imperfect produce, consume that as well, and um, and if not, you know, go consume it yourself. You know, donate it to um, to other organiz organizations who can use it. Um, my last slide here is to just say that everything old is new again. Anybody want to guess from when this this particular brochure came? Close. Another guess from the year? World War One. 1917. So this is 100 years old. <laughs> we have said in the past, and this is in the USDA archives, right? Food, don't waste it. And I'll just uh, leave us with that thought. And then um, uh, let me pause for a minute, see if there's anybody has questions on the global issues, and then we'll go right over into who went to talk about what's going on in Arlington. Any questions? Yes? Well, I think one of the things to consider, though, in keeping parts or this and that is to, is how is it grown? Because if the if the green uh, parts of the crop has been sprayed with uh, pesticides and stuff, you know, do you really want to eat it? I think that's uh, that's an issue that needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah, yeah, that's always yeah, that's an issue. Whether it's the what we consider the normal and edible part or the the inedible parts, but good point. And it, it's some of it's just a rethinking of food and how we value it and, and think about it here in the U.S. and other parts of the world. You know, everybody eats the, the cat, chicken feed and the whole parts of the chicken. So you showed a picture of Salinas there. I just visited. You may have tasted the best organic strawberry, which was almost the size of my fist, and ran through and through. And it was being thrown out because it did rain, and there was a tiny spot on that strawberry. So it's very frustrating to see that. But we do have a logistical issue and the issue that people you know, don't want to eat, you know, imperfect produce. It's just, um, I appreciate the campaign you're talking about, but I 
it's 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 a huge problem. It just it just struck me there because that's yeah. the sound bowl. Of the yeah, thanks for and thank you for raising that. There is the, you know there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are out there trying to promote imperfect produce uh, here locally as well as other parts of the country. So I think it is shifting the mindset, and a lot of this is mindset. Um, well, part of that is it it had to go two thousand miles, so it wasn't going to survive. Right. And then there, there, there is perishability, and that's that's a real factor. Um, you don't want anybody to get sick, so there will there will never be zero food waste uh, because we don't want people, you know, <laughs> eating something and then not living. <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn things over to Pu Wen uh, Lee from Arlington Food Assistance Center, APAP. And uh, come on up. We got your slides ready. Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, Don, your comment is always a challenge to me every day when I go to work. Um, when I uh, started thinking about this program and uh, my presentation, I um, recalled an incident when I was uh, just graduated from college, and I was contemplating going to graduate school, and I knew I needed to pick up some Japanese. Um, as a language and to be able to do academic research. Um, so I signed up for a course at the university, and then I um, got a job as a prep cook in a Japanese restaurant that was opening up in town. And uh, they, my first assignment was to uh, prepare um, and cook the rice uh, for the meals. And uh, so I thought, this is a cinch, and I've been doing it all my life. Um, you take the rice, you rinse it a few times to make sure the water comes clear, and then you set, like, put it in the pot and you you know put water in and set the pot to boil. Um, but I was cooking probably 90 cups of rice, um, going into a huge you know you know, rice cooker, and so I rinsed all this rice. It was well 90 would be 45 cups. Um, I was I rinsed it. The water came clear. And then they said, you need to drain it, put it into a colander, and then measure out the requisite amount of water and put it into the rice cooker. Um, and I did that. And then, as I was just going to press the on button for that rice cooker, uh, one of the chefs came over to me. And he was like, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I was like, what? You know, I was really kind of shocked. And um, he said, no. And I, I looked at the rice cooker and it's okay, right? And he said, no, and he's pointing to the colander. And I looked inside, and there were four or five grains of rice that were clinging to the bottom of that colander. And he said, never, never, never waste the rice. Um, that was uh, an awakening for me. Um, a country that reveres rice, it's their staple, they grow it for the longest time. I don't even know whether they allow um, U.S. rice or any other rice to come into their country. Um, it's sacred to them. Um, and it, uh, it's it been something I've been thinking about um, for the past couple of weeks. Um, Quick question, can you all hear Quinn in the back? I'm sorry, can you hear? No, um, so I'll stay here. Um, so here's a concept, it's a Japanese concept of uh, motanai, um, which means to regret, according to Wikipedia, um, <laughs> the sense of regret when you waste something. Um, and the top is the hiragana, um, and then the bottom is the kanji, the Chinese characters, which when you look at the kanji, you really understand what it means. It is basically the idea of denying the essence of an object or a thing. Like not you, the, denying the full potential of that, that thing. And so it could be food, it could be Wood. It could be anything. Um, so, just that's the way I want to set up this um, discussion. I work at um, AFAC, the Arlington Food Assistance Center. Um, it is the main food pantry in Arlington County. Um, it's the only food pantry in Arlington that's solely devoted to um, providing food for our neighbors in need. Um, we're an independent, community-based organization, and we've been here for close to 30 years. We operate out of a warehouse space in South Arlington. I began volunteering at um, APAC in 2005, 
And, um, at that time, we were serving about 450 to 500 client families every week. Um, we now serve close to 2,300 families every week. Um, and we distribute food at 18 sites around the county and provide food for about 19 or 20 peer agencies. Um, the increase in demand um, in these past dozen years has been driven by economic factors such as the recession, um, sequestration, um, tightening up of SNAP um, qualifications, um, and the high cost of living here in Arlington County. For those of you who live here, you know um, the price of your house that you bought maybe 20 years ago for 200000 is now $800,000. Um, um, those 2,200, 2,300 households that we uh, serve represent slightly over 5,000 individuals. A third are seniors, a third are children under the age of 18, and the, th the remaining third are the underemployed and the unemployed. Our mission has always been to provide food free of charge to Arlington residents who need food. Um, and these are supplemental groceries, which are meant to supplement other food sources. Our distribution model is to offer choice. In most food pantries, people are handed a box of assorted items. Um, the choice model, on the other hand, means that people can shop for what they prefer to eat, and that's been proven to prevent waste, um, as families are more likely to eat the foods that they prefer. Um, and so at AFAC, people shop for the, their items, and you'll see the menu that we offer. It's it's pretty balanced: um, milk, meat, eggs, bread, um, cereal, etc. Um, fresh produce that you see here. Now we give out two vegetables and one fruit, about maybe eight to ten pounds every week. Um, it's not always been on that menu. In fact, uh, the first month I started at, at AFAC in the September of 2006, as a staff member, I was surprised to see that we were handing out two pound bags of frozen vegetables um, as the produce item. And I was surprised because in my own garden, I had tomatoes and cucumbers and zucchinis and I was hanging oops on our neighbor's uh, doors and I could hardly open the drawers of my refrigerator because everything was loaded up. Um, and so I took a chance as a new employee. Um, that's the best time to ask these questions. Um, <laughs> Why are we giving out frozen vegetables? This is September. There's a lot coming in. I'm sure there are local gardeners who would like to donate um, their crops to us. So um, our director apparently heard my comment, and um, that resulted in a decision to start a fresh produce program at AFAC. Um, the next spring, um, we uh, launched what we have now started to call Plot Against Hunger, the emphasis beyond plot of the garden plot. Um, and we took the National Plant to Row for the Hungry uh, program as our model. Um, and we gave out, so we gave out free seeds to clients and also um, to gardeners and asked them to grow for us. Um, and then we started um, gleaning crops at local farms. And here are some of my favorite gleaners. Um, at USDA um, in Don's fields. And um, we, in the 2016 growing season, we um, grew 36, uh, excuse me, gleaned 36,000 pounds of fresh produce. Um, so we went to local gleaning organizations like Society of St. Andrews and to Magnet and other organizations like that. Um, and then we started asking local markets if they had vendors who would like to um, donate to us. and. Um, here you see um, some of our volunteers who are uh, picking up at the Columbia Pike Market. The first year, we only picked up at the Courthouse Market, the main market here in Arlington County. Um, we are now picking up at eight out of the 10 markets here in Arlington County. Um, and the number you see on the top, 92,143, that's the number of pounds that were gleaned at the market in 2015. That was a tally that was constantly updated. It was, the, it was above the volunteer sign-in. Um, table um, just to kind of encourage people um, that you know it's it's tough work but please keep on adding um, to that um, and by the third well end of the second year 
we realized that this three-pronged method was working very well for us. Ask local gardeners to grow for us, glean at farmers markets, and also glean in, at local farms. Um, if you look at these figures and you add it all up, um, in the past 10 years, we've gleaned 594,900 pounds of produce um, from farmers markets alone. And that's equivalent to about a million, um, $64,000 worth of produce. Um, so today I thought I would walk you through some of the considerations and planning that goes into running, I mean, doing a, a program like this where you're picking up and gleaning from a farmer's market. Um, I asked one of our volunteer coordinators if he would give me the top five things that he considers um, when he's uh, considering a market, and he came up with a list of 15. I'm just going to um, run through a few of them and you can jot down. I, I think this might be handy for people who are part of feeding programs who are considering um, doing this kind of work. So how many vendors are there at the market? Um, and how many are produce vendors? One of the things that we found in Arlington is that there are fewer and fewer produce vendors at farmers markets. There are more value-added processed food vendors. Um, that's because in Arlington we have a high proportion of single millennials making a lot of money who frankly don't know how to cook. Um, and they would rather go to the market and pick up some cheese and bread and pickles and um, jam and switchel um, and, and other items like that. Um, so that's always that's a problem. It was mentioned actually at our uh, first stop yesterday um, during the Northern Virginia tour that Potomac Vegetable Farms is finding that they have less and less ability to sell at the markets <coughs> because of uh, this uh, demand for, for processed foods. Um, figure out how many volunteers are needed. You need a driver, you'll need helpers at the market. Um, and then, is there parking? Um, will volunteers need a permit to park? If you're in, um, for instance, picking up at the Boston market, we always have to have a permit. There's, it's so crowded there. Um, and then volunteer selection, pretty simple. Um, can they physically lift 25 to 50 pounds of melons, for example, at the height of the season? Um, make sure there's sufficient supplies um, in the warehouse that they're not going to be used for anything else. Um, it, there's nothing more frustrating for a volunteer who's come in to do their work and then find that there's nothing and they have to like scramble around to find boxes and things like that. So make sure that there are enough supplies available. Um, and then have a produce team of ready um, on Saturday and Sunday afternoons at the warehouse um, who are ready to refresh and pack those uh, fruits and vegetables that are brought back from the market. Um, these produce teams started in uh, the second year. Um, I had come in on a Monday morning and there, um, I went into the cooler just to see what had been delivered from the markets. We were simply picking up from the markets and immediately putting things into the cooler. Um, and there was this huge hamper, a postal hamper full of greens there. And I saw that the top layer was wilted, and then I put my hand down, and oh my God, it was hot. We had the hottest <laughs> compost going on. 39 degree cooler, but it was probably 80, 90 degrees down in the, in the middle of that pile. And so we dumped it. We had, you know, for someone like me, that was really difficult. So we immediately set up these produce teams. We had um, supervisors um, who lead these teams every Saturday and Sunday after the markets two hours, um, groups of 12 to 15 volunteers, sometimes 20 volunteers, um, processing. So um, one of the last things was the receipts. Um, now vendors, uh, farmers are given a tax deduction uh, for their donations. That's a new thing for us and we're still trying to work through that. Um, but if they need receipts, make sure that you process them correctly. Um, so, um, to his list of 15 items, I would say continuously thank the vendors at the farmer's markets who you pick up from, and continuously thank your volunteers, because without the two of those um, elements, uh, this would not be possible. 